Every year on Lindau Island in Germany, dozens of Nobel laureates come to meet with hundreds of young scientists. It's rare for so many laureates to gather like this, so I'm taking the opportunity to ask some big questions about the state of medicine today. To try to get a picture of health. Cancer. It's a word that strikes fear into our very hearts, but just how frightened should we really be? Some scientists are suggesting that we'll more and more be thinking of cancer as a manageable illness. But how far have we really come? We are here today for the purpose of signing the Cancer Act of 1971. And I hope that in the years ahead that we may look back on this day and this action as being the most significant action taken during this administration. In the early 70s, President Nixon declared a war on cancer. Over 40 years on, are we anywhere near winning that war? Since Nixon's declaration, there have been some major breakthroughs in the cancer story. We're going to reveal some of the most significant in a timeline, stretching from 1971 to today. Starting with Tricky Dicky here. Michael Bishop was crucial in this story. It's 25 years since you won your prize, and what progress have we made in cancer in that time? Well, we've made extraordinary progress. But uh, there's still no cure for cancer. Do you think we're heading towards a cure? Are we? Well, there's not going to be a cure for cancer. Although the genetic view of cancer has unified uh, the situation, it's still uh, an extraordinary variety of diseases. Uh, and each with its own genotype, uh, its own family of uh, damaged or mal malfunctioning genes. Cancer is caused by the uncontrolled, rapid division of cells which form tumours. Why these cells start to divide uncontrollably was largely unknown until Michael Bishop came along. He looked inside the tumours at DNA. Here he found mutated genes which caused cells to divide uncontrollably. He called them oncogenes. I think the examination of the genome proper remains a forefront in cancer research. We still don't have the complete inventory. Whether every uh, type of cancer has its own uh, distinctive uh, genetic fingerprint. So I think we're looking at an entirely new taxonomy in the future, uh, which in turn will guide uh, therapy if and when we succeed in targeting a sufficient number of uh, the genetic malfunctions uh, with therapeutics. And so for the moment that the focus for you is on understanding the disease in order to later develop the therapeutics, is that the order that we should? Well, this, this is a problem that you have to understand the underpinnings. That's why we made so little progress over the last uh, 50, 60 years. We didn't understand the disease. So all of the therapeutics were based on one simple principle. Uh, cancer cells uh, ostensibly, but not always, grow faster than normal cells. And so we'll kill the dividing cells. Uh, any poison that will kill dividing cells ought to selectively kill cancer cells. Well, uh, yes and no. We know that the toxic effects of chemotherapy, classical chemotherapy, are, can be horrendous. And it's because normal cells are still dividing in our bone marrow and our gastrointestinal tract, even in our brain to some extent. And all of that was necessary because we simply did not understand the disease. Now at least we know the fundamental underpinning, and that is the malfunction of genes. Whatever the causes, and there are many causes, and we don't know most of them, and that's one of our fundamental problems, actually. But in any event, we do now have a fundamental understanding. We know where to look. Bishop published the discovery of the first human oncogene in 1979. And this work would lead to his Nobel Prize in 1989. Scientists' understanding of cancer had made a huge leap forward. We could now see it as a problem of gene expression, of mutation in core functions within our bodies. But Bishop emphasised that we were still largely in the dark about the causes of these mutations. But there are some causes of cancers which have been discovered. The impact of smoking and ultraviolet radiation were becoming clearer, and in 1983 work would be published that would prove another long-held theory that, in some cases, infectious agents like viruses are to blame. That discovery was made by Harold Zerhausen. Have you ever considered collaborating with Michael Bishop? 
Uh, Michael Bishop is working in a different field than we do. Uh, we are even working on a different philosophy, both of us. He, of course, stated cancer is derived from an imbalance between oncogenes and uh, tumor suppressor genes. Viruses and infectious agents are disturbing this beautiful picture. When did you first realize that a, a virus could be causing cancers? I speculated at it as in student times. must have been in 1958-59 or so that uh, I became aware of the fact that some phages are infecting bacteria, stay latently in those bacteria and modify the properties. And that really triggered the idea in my mind. Similarly, genome of a virus is taken up by a human cell and that it transforms the cell into cancer cell. It was a very naive idea, basically, as it turns out. It was a fairly different idea for the cancer community, if you like. Yes. How did people react? Some people, and even some famous people, became quite skeptical of whether infectious agents at all could play a role in human cancer. But basically, I was sticking to it completely. Zerhausen discovered the link between human papillomavirus, HPV, and cervical cancer in 1983. It provided a new avenue of research into cancer prevention and treatment, vaccines. By searching for a vaccine for HPV, maybe we could prevent people ever getting cervical cancer. I wondered if this could also provide hope for tackling other types of cancer. No, I, I don't think, uh, see we're talking about vaccines against known causes that are viruses. Are all cancers caused by viruses? We have absolutely no reason to believe that. Uh, I'm not talking about cancer vaccines. I'm talking about vaccines against viruses that cause cancer. But to the extent that there are tumors that are not caused by infectious agents, vaccines I think are irrelevant. Uh, the idea that we could vaccinate against a cancer cell is totally undermined by the fact that we now know more than ever by virtue of genomic evidence that, for example, breast cancer does not have a single defining uh, tumor antigen. It's interesting you mentioned breast cancer. That's one example where there's been very, very highly publicized genetic testing for some strains of breast cancer. Do you think that's, that's one of the ways we should be looking for the future? Uh, well, uh, the genetic testing for breast cancer involves just two genes that create a powerful predisposition to the disease. The genetic testing in that instance is to evaluate the members of the family for their risk. That kind of strongly inherited predisposition to cancer based on a single gene defect, their genetic testing is a reality. But the concept that we could uh, define more subtle susceptibilities is still on the table. What we know for sure is that they're polygenic to the point of impossible complexity. Uh, many genetic variants, each with a minuscule uh, impact on predisposition. Whether that will ever translate into widespread population screening, I think, is totally up in the air at the moment because we haven't solved the complexities of it. The BRCA genes, or BRCA genes, implicated in breast cancer were identified in 1994. They were the next step in understanding, screening for and preventing cancers. Working with cancer is clearly complicated, but not just because of the biology. I met two young researchers, both clinicians who were driven by their personal experience. What's it like to work with patients who are facing these cancers, be they on the treatable side or the less treatable? I find it very challenging. and. Um challenging because there are a lot of cancers that you can treat and as you just said that you cannot treat. My motivation itself to become a physician um, was initially because we had um, cancer run within the family and among my close friends. Instead of grieving for years and, and investing all this energy into this into the sadness, I just decided that um, I couldn't change this situation anymore. So I just made this decision for myself and said, okay, I want to tunnel all of this energy into research and make a difference, and even if it's just one single person. At least I could change the life with this one single person. Because I realized going through this entire battle that cancer does not only affect the patient. It's a disease that affects the entire family and friends around it. And it really is a disease with no boundaries. But what about for the cancers that are not currently treatable? Being a physician is also my job to comfort the patient and knowing as best as possible about the disease is important because then I know where the limits are. 
and making the rest of his life as pain-free as possible should be all of our goals. Many cancers remain poorly understood and are often fatal, but there are some cancers where our understanding is growing, and there are success stories. What do you think? Will cancer ever become a treatable, long-term but quite minor disease? Coming from the standpoint of someone who works on chronic myeloid leukemia, which is a kind of blood cancer, um, in the past, can, uh, patients used to um, progress to the acute blastic phase of the disease, where they would you know, perish within months. Um, but these days, uh, with the invention of a tyrosine kinase inhibitor called imatinib, they can expect to live you know, long, relatively normal lives if they just pop a pill every day. The drug imatinib deactivates an enzyme which is only found in the cancer cells of chronic myeloid leukaemia patients. This stops the cancer cells growing and can completely control this disease. It was the first time that such an effective and targeted cancer treatment had been discovered. These days, the vast majority of those suffering from childhood leukaemia survive them. In the process of my research, um, you know, I, I have to look through patient records on the computer and it's really heartening to see that you know, these patients have records spanning you know, tens of years because, simply because they have had a chance to be treated um, you know, in the case of uh, chronic myeloid leukaemia. Chronic myeloid leukaemia is not the only success story. In 2006, Harold Zerhausen's work led to the discovery and implementation of a vaccine against human papillomavirus and according to him, the impact could be huge. If we could get the HPV vaccine widely available, would that lead to an eradication of the cancer? It could. It could lead indeed to eradication of, let's say, at least those cancers which are due to the agents which are in the vaccine. Then we really have a chance to eradicate these types of infection, but only if we vaccinate globally. And is that a model that could be rolled out for other types of cancer that vaccinate and then eradicate? We see now that about slightly more than 20% of the global cancer incidence is linked to infections. And uh, um, it is, in my opinion, at least likely that this percentage is increasing in the future. For instance, it's clearly worthwhile to investigate colon cancer, to investigate uh, human breast cancer some childhood cancers like acute lymphatic leukemias, brain tumors and also neuroblastomas for potential role of infectious agents in them. Shortly after the rollout of the worldwide HPV vaccine campaigns, Zerhausen won a Nobel Prize for his work in 2008. All this is just a tiny snapshot of the progress which we've made in cancer research in the last 40 years. Nixon may have been over-optimistic, but there has been success in some areas, in others less so. The real question is, where next? So we all know somebody who's been affected by cancer, and it would seem that progress is being made, exciting things are happening, we know so much more than we used to know, but why aren't we closer to being able to fix it? Well, we are closer, we're just not there yet. Uh... And if you compare what we know about the disease now to what I knew a quarter of a century ago, it's just logarithmically different. And in one generation of scientists, we know how it operates. Uh, we don't know all its causes, but we know what those causes uh, precipitate in the cancer cell. It has totally transformed uh, our approach to taxonomy of cancer. It's in the process of transforming our approach to diagnostics, to early detection, but we're not finished by far because uh, it's a difficult, complex problem, and it has multiple facets. Every organ system's tumor is different. So it's, uh, in a way, clearly a complicated disease, but it's not unresolvable. But we can only prevent these diseases if we understand fully the type of way and mechanism by which the disease is emerging. From the conversations that I've had here, I've realised just how much progress science has made in understanding and treating cancer. But that knowledge has also revealed just how complex and diverse cancers are and just how far there still is to go.
We're here in Linlao with 37 Nobel Prize winning scientists, 600 young researchers, 12 of them sponsored by Mars, and people want to hear all about the science that Mars has been doing. Well, the great thing about coming to Lindau is that we get to spend time with science's rock stars. You're aware that you're in the presence of greatness. And the more that we can find ways of engaging some of the finest minds in the world to helping us solve some of these grand challenges, I mean, there's got to be some great stuff in there. One of the things we do is we like to have a lunch where we basically spend time with the young scientists that we've sponsored to come here and tell them a little bit about the kind of company that we are, the kind of work that we do, and why we passionately believe that these great scientists should consider coming to a company like Mars for a lifetime career in fun science that will make the world a better place. The best part really is that you get to actually meet these young scientists who will look at you in the eye and say, this is the best week of my life. <laughs> to sit with a Nobel laureate and have a conversation that is a gift. So we have a science breakfast, which is the opportunity for us to host a discussion around a very meaningful area of research of healthy aging. So we have Liz Blackburn, who won a Nobel Prize in this field, and we put her together with a group of young scientists in a forum facilitated by ourselves. Let's think about the huge amount of years that human lives are, right? So I made a little scale bar for you on this high-tech thing here. This is a time scale. What's the li maximum lifespan of a, a worm that goes from here to here, right? Of a fruit fly from here to here. Now things get a bit better. Okay, let's go all the way out to a mouse. All right, <laughs> keep going, keep going. Okay, we've got up to kindergarten. We've got decades and decades of life. So the science breakfasts are always great fun, highly interactive, and a really good way to have meaningful debate in an area of public interest, but also interest to ourselves. We're in middle age here, so maybe somebody's getting some diabetes now. I mean, that's the thing. It's not just your lifespan. There's perhaps years of living with chronic disease. I think you get the point, yeah. right? I'm just constantly struck by how we have to be thinking in terms of enormous timescales that these things are. The world is going to be facing an aging population. We're all going to get older and there's going to be a lot more of us who are old. How do we deal with that? Helping young scientists realize that they can work with somebody and realize that these are problems that the world has to solve. And business and science can do it together. I think the private sector can play a real role because the sort of research that can be done by a company that isn't necessarily related to just the uh, quarterly bottom line is the kind of research that's complementary to what governments can fund. And I think Mars is a good example of that. So we've got 37 Nobel laureates here and just over 600 young scientists and if we can play our role in catalyzing some of the magic happening between those two groups of people then we go away very happy.